Hello and welcome. It's mid-July. This is the Pick 6 Podcast, and we've got a special guest in Tom Chattel, who's come in uh, to... And Jimmy Watkins. Hello, Jimmy. Not so special. You're special. Regular. A regular guest. Busy watching the NBA Summer League and Bryce McGowan. Sort of. watching a lot of Bryce McGowan's? I watched a lot of Bryce McGowan's highlights. I'll tell you that. (laughs) I don't. I don't want to. I don't. Sam's my boss, so I don't want to tell you that I was neglecting my responsibilities. I just gave it a pass over. That's okay. Like you know what, Bryce McGowan's is now the responsibility of the Charlotte Hornets. Summer and league if, is. If he's a if he's an all star, then I want a big story. Uh, but other sure. than that, the big story uh, around here for the last several weeks has been um, that uh, the Los An- the Los Angeles, the city of Los Angeles, went to the Big Ten, and it's UC USC UCLA. Tom wrote a great column. I like the first one, but I really like that second one, that the, the Big Ten has changed its nature and that it's now like a predator, um, and it's different, and it is different. I think it's very different. This was a different kind of move than the, than the previous two, and we'll get into that in a minute. We will also talk a little bit of basketball. Um, you know, they've been kind of having these media events. Armand Gates took a different job. We spent a lot of time talking. I, I don't think it's that big of a deal, but we can talk about Armand Gates leaving, who they might go after, why it matters that the guy left now. This is, by the way, a trend in Nebraska men's basketball. They've always, they've often had assistants leave during the summer for some reason. Um, and then we've got some really good questions. I asked them on Twitter last night. I asked for questions, and we got four or five. Um, and a couple of them are, uh, you know, a little interesting. Spicy. So, yeah, spicy. So we'll we'll see where it goes. Um, but I want to start with this and this 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 to you, Tom. So you wrote a really good column a couple weeks ago, right after the Big Ten added USC and UCLA. Boy, that happened fast. That was not a. If you remember, the Maryland Rutgers thing was God, about a week. I mean, it was this was it was reported in the morning. It was done by five p.m. and they were added and. You know, BTN had the programming, and they were ready to roll. There was no rumblings. There was no, you know, it, the dance had already been done before anybody got it out. And so the Big Ten managed this edition a little bit different than the previous two, and it did feel like this is a different league. So in the two weeks since that happened, any reflections on on the addition of those two schools and we're two weeks out from Big Ten Media Days. The presumption was, that, and you've brought this up to me, that they were going to add, they were going to announce the TV deal at the Big Ten Media Days. Kevin Warren's going to get up and announce it. Do you think that's going to happen? And if so, is there going to be another team attached to it? Wow. Uh, I know it's a lot. I'm, I'm, <laughs> now go. I'm, I'm still on vacation, by the way, and <laughs> these things keep happening to me. Um, that's fine. It was better than last summer. The... Um, this was rumored a year ago, and and people, I remember people saying, "Well, you know, USC and UCLA should go to the the Big Ten. Yeah, there was that rumor going around after the OU and Texas went to the SEC that okay, what's the Big Ten going to do? Well, they should go after these guys because there aren't many people, aren't many schools left that that, that have that kind of value, who are are, are sort of game changers in the." Uh, the TV scene. So that was kind of thrown out there and then it went away. Um, this was, this was amazing to me on different levels um, because the big 10 just, they, it, nobody talked about it or even, you know, there was no speculation, um, but that they would throw the PAC 12, their longtime brothers, and the Rose Bowl, the icon of icons. What would Dick Emberg have said? Under the, oh, my. Oh, my, about <laughs> ten times. Um, you are looking live. That's must be. At a high, I know. Well, I'm, okay. I'm just okay. well, okay. I'm taking my – this is my childhood. Okay. Right? That's That's true. True. Looking <laughs> live at a highway robbery. That, mm-hmm. as, as Brent. Um, he did some Rose Bowls. Yes, yeah. he did. Um, but they, they threw him under the bus. They, they basically killed him. Yeah. They killed the Rose Bowl. The Big Ten did. And it wasn't, it wasn't even Delaney. It was – Kevin, Kevin Warren, Warren uh, clumsy Bas- basketball clumsy Kevin, guy, you know NFL guy. Yeah, um, and he, the the man of inaction from COVID, right? Everybody hated him. Everybody wanted him out. Now all of a sudden, he's the the Terminator. Yeah. And he, he, you know, now I would argue that this was every bit as much Fox Sports as it was Big Ten. But he has relationships with them from the well, NFL days. I think. I think Fox and ESPN are calling the shots, but the the leagues are only too happy to go along with them. So, right. anyway, 
Um, but it's quiet. It we, we you know they, that these things realignment. We all get excited when they happen. Our, our minds race, imaginations explode, and we think, well, it's going to go to 20 schools, it's going to do this, it's going to do that. And then I just sort of like, okay, two weeks later, okay, nothing's going to happen for a while. It, it, it may be two more years um, un, until the, 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 the Big Ten TV changes over, the new, the new contract. Uh, you know, we find it. But we're basically waiting on one uh, school one uh, a- entity, and that's the Irish. Fighting Irish, that's that's the list. That's the list. Um, the rest of Pac-12, sorry about everything, but here, here's how I feel about those little schools. You know, Oregon and Washington are going, well, what about us? Um, if, if the Big Ten and SEC, they will tell you who has value and who doesn't. If they don't want you, you don't have value. So if they had, if those schools had value, they'd be scooped up by now. So that doesn't mean they can't at one time, but they're, that would just be adding to add uh, at this point. I think the most likely addition, if, if Notre Dame comes in, would, 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 would be Stanford. They are— That'd be Notre Dame's dance partner. I think that they're already uh, have a series, a long time, a long time history. Stanford— is, is more out of the, the Big Ten cloth of academic um, snobbery, uh, academic excellence. Oh, yeah. Um, That's a great school. Um, you know, I said, well, would Northwestern let them in? They, they, they recruit the same kind of students. Northwestern's not going to have a say in them like that. So, you know, I, I just think we're going to wait and see what, 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 the, what the money is. But I think Notre Dame is going to wait and see what, about the the playoff future, that to me that's the big thing for them. Can they still access the playoff? How many schools are are, are going to be in and out? And but also the money. But they don't get much money for all the you know. We, we, we when Notre Dame had NBC, oh, they're it's unfair. They have all this advantage. Yeah, they're, they're kind of at the bottom of the list right now in terms of individual schools getting money. So, um, can they really? Okay, we'll, we'll settle for. Are uh, uh, thirty million uh, when Big Ten's getting a hundred? Can they really ignore that? Mm. I don't know if they can. So, I think that I think we're still a couple years away from that. But as we saw, Sam, it could happen any day. <laughs> it could happen tomorrow. So, um, I don't. I don't, I don't think anything's going to be announced in two weeks. Uh, the, the the media m- might be, but I think what did I? I read somewhere that it's it might be August for that. So. They, they announced the TV deals. So I've been to the Big Ten Media Days every year since 2011 when I joined the World Herald. They announced they announced one of the TV deals at the Big Ten Media Days. You remember that. Delaney explained it. Yeah. This is like one of his last years there. And remember they had the programming guy that got up there and they talked about all the things they were going to do with Ohio State and Michigan. Um, and so I remember that distinctly. So we'll see if that happens. Um, you ever been to Notre Dame, Jimmy? Me? Been, yeah, I have not. Stadium. I've driven through South Bend yeah. on my many treks to Indiana. It would be a pretty special edition. It, it That's would, one football stadium that measures up to Nebraska. That would be for everything Notre Dame means. They're the number one piece out there. Yeah, it, it, it would be checkmate. Yeah, it really would. The SEC couldn't match that, and uh, SEC is kind of stuck. They no, no, nobody can really leave the ACC right now unless. Unless somebody's lawyer is really, really good, uh, because of the the grant of rights goes through 2036, and ESPN probably isn't going to break up the ACC. They they got they got to get Clemson or or uh, Florida State in the SEC. They've, they've, got, they've got too good a deal. Yeah. So, but I wonder if there's a chess move. The Big Ten getting NBC. I think they get that if, if NBC can deliver Notre Dame. Well, was that, that's. Yeah. I bet that's going on right now. Yeah, that's what I think, too. My favorite part of the column was there, it was only like a graph or so, was that you directly addressed what this means for Nebraska. And you nailed it. They better get good. Like, they can't screw around. Yeah. And the, the point that you made is everybody's got money now. Um, so Nebraska's going to make a lot of money in this deal. 
but Northwestern's going to make a lot of money, and Purdue's going to make a lot of money, and Indiana's going to make a lot. No, nobody's nobody. This isn't this isn't Nebraska in 1998, and this school over here in the big, you know, Iowa State, you know, sister of the poor. Yeah. This is everybody's making a hundred million dollars, and everybody can build whatever the hell they want, and everybody can build an NIL thing, and like the point that you made about Nebraska better get its house in order because they've. They've been kind of screwing around for the last 10 years before Trev got there of just having everybody on the same page. And they've they just had their lowest finish in the Directors Cup as a result. Three the three top men's programs or the three most prominent men's programs all struck out. I you know and uh, Jimmy knows just being a, a LA guy um when USC gets it going, they're as good as anybody in the country right. and they just go and you know the the Big Ten will no longer be this uh, Woody and Bo, the league of Woody and Bo, right. the league of hands offs, um, league of Ohio State, Michigan. It's they're going to change, and if you bring another name into that, which I think could happen, then it becomes the, the, oh. the, 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 the it's entirely different animal. Forget it, and, and it's, <laughs> it's so competitive. And if you're talking about trying to make the playoff. I mean, you're probably going to get. If it goes to 12, maybe 16, you never know at this point. Um, probably getting maybe four teams in, maybe. Um, well, what are the chances that Nebraska hasn't been one of those four? Yeah. You've got USC, Notre Dame, Ohio State, Michigan, Michigan State, everybody. I mean, it's um, Penn State. You, you better get your act, act together. And you know you know what? Money doesn't matter. They've had money. And they, and they haven't gone to a bowl game. So... Uh, it's it's about the head coach. You gotta get the right head coach. It's good to have money, um, but the facilities aren't gonna be the show anymore. It's the NIL is and Nebraska's the show. doing okay there. Yeah, but 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 everybody players, else catch up. Players are coming. Yeah. You, you, know, you guys follow recruiting. Players come for NIL now. They don't come for the the, the, right. the lockers. Yeah, you were talking about building facilities with with that extra hundred million. How about just throwing it in wads of stacks of cash Absolutely. <laughs> at five star kids? No question. And and the other let's let's look at this too. Like Iowa has been has outperformed Nebraska for seven years, but Iowa was not doing that with high, highly rated recruiting classes. They were you know they were the you know the thirty eight forty development. Well now Iowa's getting twenty. <laughs> They're ranked ahead of Nebraska right now, and they got a five-star offensive tackle, and they've got a couple forced. Like now, they're recruiting because they have the money. Like you have to do something with the money, and so what you do is, well, let's go hire some more recruiters. And <laughs> like all of a sudden, now all of these other schools have the exact same advantages that Nebraska has, and I do think that you know Nebraska's facility will be the best when it's finished. But you know what? A facility can only be so nice. Like, it can only the, be so much of a separator before other things matter. The collective is going to matter more. Yeah, well, I agree with you. And and I think recruiting, okay, people love recruiting. I'm not going to, I'm not going to throw water on that. It matters. But the transfer portal will, will become a bigger, de- bigger deal. So the, the biggest disparity between Nebraska and Iowa this offseason was that Nebraska led the league in transfers, and Iowa had one. Almost we're led, gonna find out. Almost led FBS. They did. USC was yeah. number one. Yeah. Ironically, well, Oklahoma was fourteen. You know, they they had that, fourteen. Nebraska yeah. fifteen. Well, and by the way, the the uh, similarities between those two programs, they changed head coaches. Nebraska didn't. They changed staffs, which is close, but that's a, a key oh, difference. I, it's, no it's question. Un- about it's it. unusual for a school that retains a head coach to do that. It was an at acknowledgement the same level. that we did. Yeah. I think it's overhaul. an acknowledgement that they did not recruit well. It's an overhaul. And, and that COVID affected recruiting. Like, it's it's an acknowledgement of, okay, our 2020 and 2021 classes kind of got screwed up because of COVID, and so we need to bring in some guys that went other schools, like Texas and LSU and whatever, and now they want to come here. So, I don't want to do – I just real quick. I don't yeah. want to do too much too much Alonzo Virgin clear out here for me because this is – obviously you guys do a great dance. But I do think it's interesting that we are framing the Big Ten as a predator here, as, as if they – you know, flew a, a private plane to LA and had super secret right. private meetings in this hostile situation. From what I understand, UCLA and USC came to the Big Ten and they said, did. "Please, like Oliver Twist, please, please take us. 
please take us, which I think exactly like that's that could not work out better possibly for the Big Ten because the SEC OU Texas thing was messy and that did have like that cowboy lassoing, you know, a bull kind no of question. feel to it and yeah. it was crazy and people were really upset about it. The Big Ten just got to, you know, remain its buttoned up suity you know fits exactly who kevin warren is just like we just took what came to us you know like they can still claim the moral high ground on the sec that that as as much of as much of the identities as the of the conferences are changing that part remains intact and i think the big 10 is absolutely elated about that to tom's point about uh notre dame being a checkmate i do think that clemson if clemson can return to the level that it was at before last year is a pretty nice chess piece to play, and I could also grab Miami, Florida State. The contracts thing is is very real, and but maybe maybe this is my NBA brain talking, where superstars sign a contract and request the trade the next day. I've just seen too many contracts get broken without any penalty to ESPN believe that. ESPN would have to break its own contract, and they would have to beat the ACC in court. I just don't. I I I have lost faith in the value of contracts. I th- I feel ESPN like if there's a will, to, there's a way. Would have to break its own contract and they would have to beat the ACC in court, not Clemson, not Florida State, the league would sue the TV network. The reason they would do that is the league would cease to exist if ESPN breaks its contract. Okay. And so the challenge there but if you're is AC- how do you do it? If you're the ACC, I think ESPN could just push in and say, we have all this leverage you have to break because if you're the ACC – if you lose that lawsuit, I, don't know, I mean, I think it's unlikely that they would because yeah, ESPN will be committing a well, big ESPN boo-boo. ESPN have to pay them billions sure, and sure, billions sure, of sure. dollars. Yeah. But if you lose Clemson, FSU, Miami, whatever, those are your those are your money cows. That's correct. So if you lose the lawsuit somehow, some way, mm-hmm. how do you pay for it? I, I, I just I, don't I, think they would lose. I, I think I, I don't I, think so either. I, but and I don't think the SEC. They, they they don't need Clemson. They don't. They don't really need no. the Florida State. They don't. Who, by the way, isn't really doing much anyway. Um, Did they need Texas and Oklahoma? I don't know that they care whether they well, need. But that's yes because of the the, the, the TV numbers. I don't, I don't think Clemson brings the TV numbers and and Notre Dame. I think you get Clemson and Alabama on the, the same TV, field. I think the Texas Oklahoma thing was a was a co package ploy to manipulate the playoff. Yeah. And so I think they took right, Texas right. and Oklahoma yes. in the same time Sankey was trying to push through these these changes in the playoff right. immediately and the ESPN would keep the entire contract yes. and the Big 10 and the Pac-12 and the ACC stood in its way. And so yeah. I don't know and I have I've I've long thought this. I think Texas and Oklahoma are going to regret it. I don't think it's I uh, maybe Oklahoma won't. I don't know. Yeah, it's hard. It's hard to get inside yeah, Oklahoma. Yeah, yeah. I think Texas will. I I, I don't. I think they they're joining a league with Texas A and M in it, and the, I think they were very happy to be away from Texas A and M for ten years, and now they're back in that league, and it's gonna yeah. be hard. To Notre Dame, the Notre Dame property is so different from any other college football property that is currently available, including Clemson. It just, the reason it is, is because it just involves so much history and so much um, of the thing that makes college football special, college sports special, which is just, there is a romanticism and a, and a, and a um, what do you want to call it, a warm sense about Notre Dame that is completely untethered from its success. Clemson yeah. is Clemson because it's Clemson. Florida State is Florida State because it's Florida State. And that's on the field. Notre Dame could be bad. There's been one Heisman Trophy winner in, in history who won on a losing team, and it was Paul Horning at Notre Dame. That's because it's Notre Dame. What if I told you, okay, so you're 100% right. There is no school. Not even close. No school maybe that exists in any conference anywhere that can match the historic power that go, comes with Notre Dame. I, I would encourage you to go there we because are, you go there and you know. Well, I'd love to. Bring them in. Kevin Warren, get busy. Well, but, but I mean, like, when you're just driving through South Bend, just go okay. to the campus. Okay. Go to the campus, you know. But are we not it's different. Are we not pivoting towards a college football world that, that clearly values everything that Notre Dame embodies that you just said less? The history, less. Tradition, less. We're building, we're building towards two super conferences with – out much tr- tradition we'll history between them 
And I think in that world, right. as we get further and further away from tradition, Alabama Clemson on the same field again. If Clemson can return right. to its Trevor Lawrence, Deshaun Watson era form, I think that that reality I, I don't has think so. Alabama, in ten years, point, in ten, not now, in ten years, is, in ten years. Mean, we've already seen Clemson at the top, yeah, right. And they think about Georgia now. They think they're going to have LSU. But that's what I'm saying. If you have all those schools and those, you got two or three of those guys playing each other every year. Um, I think they already like, got them. That's if what you, people are going to care about in ten years. If you had an in-season tournament, then maybe. I think the challenge with well, it is on that, the table. But what I would say is that part of what informs Notre Dame's value is is the things that we just mentioned, mm. and that informs their TV ratings. The, the, one of the highest rated games every single year in college football is Army Navy. Right. Why? Not because of the quality of the teams. Sometimes the teams are three and eight. The reason that that game is important is because it has an elevated value. The best program of the 20 uh, in the last 25 years of all the military academies is neither one of them. <laughs> But Air Force, well, Air Force doesn't have the same cachet. So it doesn't hurt that they play that game during a week where there's no other college football. Right. But still, but there's also a certain level it's of the history alumni and value to, to it. Sure, and and that, and, that, and that, that's Notre Dame. We turn we, right. We we turn on the Army Navy game to see the one group of guys, yeah. the the cadets in in their in their coats, it's, and the Navy guys in their grays. And snow we game. watch the football. That game. snow game a couple years ago. Sure. Unreal. Sure. Unreal. Sure. And it, Notre Dame is the same thing. And so, like the Big Ten, adding that would mean enormous value. There is something, and you, you saw it last year when you went to the you know the Michigan game, there is something about seeing Michigan's helmet, mm-hmm. irrespective of how good they are, in your stadium. That's what makes college football special. Um, it's a little bit different than the NFL. I love the NFL probably as much and maybe a little more than college football, but it's what makes college but football we're, special. I think college football is getting more and more like the NFL every single day, and that's why I think... Maybe. You know, have I mean, if Clemson oh. can get back to Clemson and Miami and Florida State, a lot of potential with those programs if you inject those schools with a bunch of money i think the sec I, could stake a claim to have an a, an equal share of sure. of clout for lack well, of a better well, word a lot of than the big clout. 10 no yes question. for well, sure they have for the sure. most clout right now yeah but i'm just That's saying interesting. i don't know if i agree with that if you oh i think so if you uh they're number one and, and if, if you're talking about college football they're gonna be they're gonna, they're gonna have a probably a, a bigger contract than the, the I, unless they get Notre Dame, <laughs> but if you took and 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 I, I think Miami is going to knock Clemson down a notch or two. They're going they're going to get really good if he can coach. I, I I think I think he can. So we'll see. But if if and, I, and that's gonna be the last thing I'll say about this. Uh, if, if you get the SEC the choice, you can have Notre Dame or Clemson. Oh, I'm not arguing that at all right, right now. Right. I just think. The landscape is changing, and what is valued today may be different in 10, 15 years. But it's still valued. It's possible. But, but the, the money is, will always be valued, oh, yeah. and that's what Notre Dame and, yeah, And we're talking about money today. So, yeah, I'm with you. In two weeks' time, Nebraska will start training camp, uh, actually in 13 days. Um, yes. I was, so I, was, I'm, I was writing a column about Oklahoma um, because I do these off-season opponent columns. Watched Venables yesterday, but I actually went back to Venables spring football press conferences and I'm kind of going through just all the stuff that Venables is about and all this and I'm looking at their roster and I'm like Oklahoma football is probably not going to be that great this season I don't know maybe they will maybe they won't be but it kind of got me in that mode again because I hadn't done one in a while of just thinking about Nebraska's football season and I kind of took a step back and we're going to be starting to do training camp previews next week and I'm like what do we think about this team like what do we know nothing what can we prove <laughs> We don't know anything what, about What are we confident about? I've, I've been getting asked that question every day from people. There are yeah. people. That's why I know football is coming. Cause I'm getting, how are we going to be? What, what do you think? What were we doing at, on What's the game day of the be? championship game of the College World Series, Tom? We were arguing about what the record was going to be I mean, in the and, press box. And, and, yeah. I, and I tell people, look, this is not, they don't want to hear this, but it's the truth. they got 15 transfers who are probably all going to be have a factor. You you tell me how those guys are going to play, and I'll tell you I'll tell you where, where the record is going to be. We don't know, and and we don't and I mean this is kind of like the, the movie the uh, uh, replacements. These guys are replacements. They're coming in to take over, and they've never played together before. That's right. They're they're a bunch of guys. Shane Falco. 
some of them, yeah, same, some of them have been developed. Others have not been developed. And they have, nobody has been developed in Nebraska. Yeah. They don't know the coaches. They don't know. This is a thing that's being thrown together. Okay, here we go. It's, this is our Hail Mary. And so we're going we're gonna to throw all these guys together with a new offensive coordinator and a new offensive line coach and a new receivers coach. And we're gonna we're gonna cross our fingers and hope it works out. Um, they, they, they've got to get on the same page and of, of the same mind in 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 uh, however many practices in August, and then they go all get on a flight to Ireland and, and play somebody that is the same thing every year. Well, they're not. Yeah, they're also not very good. Right, they're but good. but how good is Nebraska? Yeah, that's, that's what I'm. I'm, don't get me started. Well, at least the schedule's easier this well, year. Easy schedule this year. I'm just going. No, it's Nebraska not. Nebraska beat Northwestern 56 to seven last year. Right. And the and again, I could be completely wrong, and you can never discount ever discount Pat Fitzgerald. The team that they have this year is not like better. <laughs> it's it's kind of the right. I'm right. not saying Nebraska's going to go win 56 seven, but the best player on last year's team left. They, the quarterback is kind of the same, and they had a bunch of guys leave. Like they're in a re, they're in a serious rebuild. So like, I just I don't think they're going to be very good. Now that Illinois wasn't very good, and Nebraska wasn't very good because you know. So maybe Nebraska's not very good, and if they lose to Northwestern, I think I would worry. Well, but <laughs> Things is, are going to get bad fast. But this is okay. If people don't know anything about these players, they don't, and. It's a, Good point. So that's why they think it's, they're going to be good. Well, these guys must be good because they, they came here. or they're it's like, it's like a new toy. They're all new toys. Well, they, 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 these guys are pretty good. Right. Well, and in the case of the TCU um, pass rusher, yeah, he's but he hasn't gone against Big Ten offensive linemen either. I mean, it's it's no argument here. A lot of questions. Yeah. And, um. You know, we heard the, the Texas writers of the World Series tell us about Casey Thompson. What'd they say? He, he's got good and bad. He's he's not perfect. He 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 will you know he he did, he did cost them a game or two last year by a interception or um, he's so he's not this savior. Okay. Did they like him as a guy? Um, was all right, or? Yeah, I think so. I think I'm like. Yeah, I think so. Huh. Um, but I'm just saying, we don't know. You know he's we don't know. And that's that's absolutely true. And this, this is not. Yeah. The one, the one thing that's the same as the head coach and the culture has not been one of we're going to execute. We're going to things are going to be locked down, and yeah. per, we're going to we're going to do things the right way. Things have not been that way. So, um, I think the 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 the, the, the physicality of Nebraska. Has been fixed. I don't. I don't, do not believe they did not lose to Wisconsin or Iowa the last couple of years because they got worn down or they got beat up. I agree. They matched them, but when it comes down to special teams, Wisconsin re- returns a kick, Iowa blocks a punt. This thing, that thing, they still add up. So, and one thing I, I I wonder about. We don't have to get into it here, but nil. And that's not just in Nebraska. That's the whole country this year. What's the impact of that going to be? If you get your money, I got my money. I got two hundred thousand. Do you have to? Do you have to show up? Do you have to play? Do you have to play well? Are you going to grind? How much do you care? Interesting question. It is. I think it's more of an interesting question. Like, what happens if you don't play well and you're benched? Like, can, how, can you stomach being a two hundred? You know, a guy who makes two hundred grand and sits on the bench. If, if the money's in the bank. I mean, I could. Don't get like, right. I know me. But Everybody's different. I think these. I mean, these guys are trying to build we, that two hundred grand into we, twenty million in the NFL one day. And these are kids; they're not professionals. But we, uh, it's, what Tiger Woods said this week about about LIV. You know, how can you not want to grind? How can you not want to go out and work to be better? You know, compete and that's Tiger Woods. Not everybody does like that. So you'll have college football players who are going to want to. You know they're they're, they're they're gonna want to beat everybody and 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 become better every day. And there might be some guys who say, "I got my money." Eh, if we lose, I got my money. I I don't want to turn. I don't want to linger on the nil thing. Right. I agree with Tom. 
that but this you're going to this off season. No, I'm not going to. That's not. This is not. A, I don't want to do this, but I'm going to do it. I actually don't. I'm. I'm telling everyone. I we're do done with that conversation though, so now. Okay. We're done with it. I'm. I'm being upfront. I do think that there's like it felt. It feels like this entire off season has been like a three month long recruiting promotion. Just like, hey, look at. Look at Brian Applewhite tweeting now, go Big Red. Look at all the guys Mickey Joseph's bringing in. Look at how much better they're doing. Yeah. Kansas City, blah, 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 five-star. You know, look at Trey Palmer. Look at what he could be. Look at the guys who were in the yeah. room at LSU. Look at, you know, four-star, four-star, all that. It's noise. Mm-hmm. It's noise. It matters. We've had this conversation before. It sort of matters, sort of doesn't. What does matter is what Tom said, the culture. And what I think culture is – one of very few things that we can kind of gleam an insight to from talking to guys during the spring and sure. and monitoring them during the off season, it feels like I I, I think Scott Frost deserves credit to, uh, for this insofar as I think he stepped back a little bit and put his hands up and said, "You guys individually, you position coaches, set the cultures in your own room." And I think Mickey Joseph, when you hear Mickey Joseph talk, mm-hmm. you think people are getting away with stuff in that room? No. No. Brian Applewhite, when you hear him talk, sounds different. Yeah. Bill Bush, sounds different. I mean, yeah. it sounds different for a lot of reasons, yeah. but he also has a track record. It's not. Of, yeah. He also has a track record. Yeah. So based on what I've heard, do you want to say I can point to one thing and say that could be something that was improved at the offseason that could yeah. make a big difference. Mm-hmm. Just those little yeah, the special team foibles, the mental mistakes, mm-hmm. the, you know, waiting for the other shoe to drop. I think that stuff can be exercised in a summer. And I think from what I've heard from the coaches, I think that there's been some progress there. I don't think that'll ever go away completely because too many of these guys lived it all last year right. and some the year before and it'll be really interesting to see what happens if Northwestern goes up 10 nothing because you know someone took home a tipped pick six yeah or whenever that happens it's going to happen at some point that's a fascinated great, to see what happens that's a great way to go behind 10 nothing yeah fascinated to see what happens when that happens yep. but right now based on what i've heard during the spring i think they are better equipped to deal with that hmm. that's good we'll we'll see i i'm jury's out it's still out on special teams too, and that's because absolutely we have to see all this stuff. That Bill Bush cannot control. There are things I think that a position coach who coaches running backs can control easily, more easily than whether or not a punter is having a good day. Recruiting a good punter is recruiting a good punter. You have to get a great one. It's very hard, I think, to change that habit within the course of a game. It's just tough. So we'll see. Like I, you know, I think the guy they got's pretty good. Um, I do have a wonder about you know Casey Thompson and his thumb and what's going on there exactly, because you know we reported that when Evan kind of sat down with him and we that created seen, some waves. We haven't seen Chubba as and it he, should he have. Too much in the spring. Yeah, it should have. What is? It's been freaking eight months and this guy's still on a pitch count. That's crazy to me. Yeah, I think it's it's entirely possible it could be precautionary, and we're getting too caught up in off season. I said this on the radio this week. There's too much baseball on TV right now. We're, we're consuming too much baseball. There's nothing else happening. It's so slow, but and we already know thing, he's going to be in the World Series yeah, anyway. The thumb thing is so the thumb though, thing is just so weird. It's going to be college football and NFL in the next week for sure. Yep. Yeah. We're almost Big there. Big twelve media day started yesterday. That was fun. What side note? Back to back to Tiger for a minute. If 10 years ago I told you that Tiger Woods was going to be the guy that, you know, is kind of the hero of that moment and Phil Mickelson is sort of the villain, you wouldn't have believed it. <laughs> but yeah, it's true. It's big time true. I don't it's think happened. people care, though. People still are, like, loving Phil the same way they loved him, right? No, people it, who really love yeah. golf? I don't think so. Okay. Yeah. How many of those are there, though? I think most people just think Phil would be like, oh, hellacious seeds. Literally Look at that millions. guy. He makes great Twitter fit. Literally millions. Like, I'll just say that, like, people that I talked to, whatever. When Tiger Woods said that earlier this week, there was like, yeah, that was that he said that sure. will change the it, opinion of the whole thing. It, it was huge. Um, it was huge. This has been your Husker Golf Minute. Hey, I love golf. <laughs> um, there you go. Yes. So let's so, talk basketball for a minute, yeah. Jimmy. Um, Armand Gates left the program and uh, went to Oregon. Uh, Dane Altman, apparently Fred Hoiberg said that Dane had been talking to him for a month. Uh, I'm not sure what what role is Armand Gates taking there. He's an assistant coach. He is. Yeah, because they have three assistants. So is one of them not, leaving? They have two on there. Okay. On their website. Okay. 
Okay. I thought I'm they still, had three. That's, I've, I was looking this up because okay. I've been waiting on an Oregon press release. Okay. Sam knows what I'm talking about all I week. Do. Yeah. And I've been refreshing so it took that website. To hire him. So I, you know, apparently yeah. it wasn't the, it was, an immediate. Yeah. There's probably some the moving first, pieces going on there. The first choice or whatever. So Dana, Dana, so, Dana, Dana Allman did not return my call on this so subject. He so he left. Um, yes. Okay. So what's the timeline for hiring a new coach? And I'm going to say this because does it matter? In I college think, football, it really matters. Oh, for sure. Does it matter in college basketball if you have three assistants in, uh, some, in the summer? Some, yeah, because there's a live recruiting period happening right now. Um, maybe okay. not as much as I initially thought, as fans initially thought. There's like an initial shock period where it's like, oh, my God, losing an assistant in the middle of a recruiting period. Oh, my God, what's going to happen? Like I right. went on the radio on Saturday and said, you know, they might have to they might have to let Tommy Emanuel, their new player, like what if he's the third assistant now? It's just like Fred, Fred and everyone else just like, take a breath. Be all right. Yeah, it's, uh, put guys on the put guys on the road that I haven't mean, been on. You know, yeah. Matt Holt, the video coordinator, Luca Virgilio, the director of basketball strategies. New new title for Luca, by the yeah, way. I noticed that. Um, have not ever been assistant coaches before, but Luca's been around Matt Abdul Massey for like six years at St. John's in Nebraska. Right. He's sure. not foreign to him. Matt Holt has been in this program since Hoiberg has been here. I'm pretty right. sure. They're not clueless. They all have like aspirations to stay in this business and move up. Yeah. So sure. you can trust those guys. Yeah. It would be better if you had a guy with recruiting connections in that space and you know creating new threads, new contacts, right. kids that you weren't talking to before. And I think that's a big part of the guy they're going to go after next. But it's not this. The sky's falling. What are we going to do? Oh my God! The summer's ruined. Yeah. Kind of deal that it felt like. Because again, it's just part of it is just. It was a surprise. I, I was at the gym when this happened, and I was like, "Oh my god, this is crazy!" Blah blah blah. And it's just like, take you know, yeah. give your mind a, br- a minute to breathe. It's gonna be all right. <laughs> I, I I feel like Fred's in this place where some some coaches get where it's sort of a year to year right now until he he can he, until he can get a little bit of breathing room. Um, does the recruiter matter? Yes, it always matters. But I can't figure out if the the, the 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 Hoiberg transfer show was Admiral NASA or was it Fred? And you know, does Fred want to build a program from the ground up with with, with a bunch of recruits? And I think, but he's got to get to that point where he can do that. And he so he's he's got to get to he's got to get through this year and get to next year. And so, um, right now I. Um, it, it, it's a good question, but I, I think you've always got to be recruiting. But you know, where's his mind at in terms of well, we get to this year, then I'll, get, I'll bring some more transfers in next year. We'll try to get to the next year. Is that where things are? Tom, you just made a ton of great points there. To your uh, Fred or Matt, who's the transfer? It doesn't matter. They've it's always they've always been linked. They've always been the same guy. So it's impossible. Like. It's impossible to separate the two because Matt is recruiting for Fred. So we might learn more about that in the next few years if Fred keeps it together. Yeah. But right now, it's, that question is redundant. Yeah. They're the same same entity, right? To your point about the the year-by-year thing, that's huge as they try to find a new replacement because <laughs> there's, you're going to have a really, really hard time finding a good assistant if it's a one-year deal. You know, especially yeah. if you're grabbing a good assistant right now, probably someone who already has a right. job, and you're asking them to leave a situation where they have security, or at least, at the very least, the same amount right. of security that they would have at Nebraska, with no guarantee that they're going to ha- be there long term. That's really tough. And to your point about how does Fred want to build his program, <laughs> I think that's a shifting paradigm because Sam and I talked about last week really interesting contrast happening in that program right now between. The people they brought in to be the quick fixers this year, Jawan Gary, Emmanuel Banamel, Sam Griesel, Blaze Keita. What's the common thread between those guys? Big, physical, strong, move bodies. And now who are they recruiting out on the on the trail They're right not, now? Yeah. Parker Fredrickson, skinny, shooter. Price Sanford, skinny, shooter. Trey Green, 5'10". 5'10". I, I, <laughs> I wonder if there's a little bit of back and forth between, I think Fred between did what, Trev... Who wants to build a program? Recruits. Uh, in, in, in this league, you got to be physical, uh, defense, um, and Fred. 
Jawan Gary, Sam Griesel, Emmanuel Bandamel is Fred telling Trev what he wants to hear. Trev went on the radio and said, go get guys who play defense and play Big Ten basketball. Fred said, okay, if that'll give me another year, I'll do that. Meanwhile, he still thinks his way is going to work. That's what I think is happening. Oh, that's interesting. And I think the most important assistant this year will, will be Sam Griesel. Uh-huh. I mean, the, I coach on the floor. Uh, the leader they haven't had. Mm-hmm. I think that's possible. I think it's possible. I, you know. Ah. Uh, the, the Husker kid, the Husker Husker I don't think he, you know, imposed roster. No, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying I don't think he, I, that, I don't want that to be the takeaway from what I said there. Right. I just think, but he, but he, he, I mean, he, he didn't say, Fred, you have to go get out. these. He did go out in public the day after he extended the man's contract and say, this is what we need, though. Yeah. And Fred absolutely heard those yeah. comments. I mean, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not exaggerating when I say, and I give the first season a grace. It, it may have been the worst. The first Fred's first team may have been the worst bas- Nebraska basketball team right. I've ever seen. They didn't have a lot of Division One basketball players the, on the roster. This most recent team was probably the worst in terms of underachievement. There's just it. But it didn't work. Like it was. They were. They all. were like loathsome to watch. But don't you think Trev has the told last week of the year has told Fred and every coach, this is how our this is what our department is going to be all yeah. about, and it's going to be. Um, it's going to be about recruiting. It's going to be um, uh, about having a foundation, about the, the fundamentals, uh, the, 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 the culture, all the blah, blah, blah stuff. Um, yeah. I think every program is going to be that way. Yeah. And I, so I think Fred has been told, if you're going to be here, this is what we have to have. In which, the NFL, they you say. you can have and still have like talent and all yes. that. In the NFL, well, they no, say. Absolutely, but I'm saying, like, but, yeah. you, but you can't do transfers every year. I think that's an inevitable reality of where, where football, the sport is now. I, I think football has to watch getting yeah, on, getting on that. Uh, sure, on that 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 sort of treadmill. So, anyway, the fundamental change that I think that Hoiberg will have to is that a lot of teams get transfers now, and there there has to be a kind of this isn't about like building a basketball purity contest. It's do you want to stay at a school for a long period of time and build a program over that period of time that's going to go up and down, but it's going to have a consistent underpinning of identity? And I think the biggest question, uh, you know, as I've watched these first three teams, is I'm just like the head coach needs to be more of a presence because I would think – and see, there's Fred, – Fred doesn't have a big enough ego to be the kind of person who says, I want to recruit guys who played like I did in college. A lot of these guys don't play like Fred played at all. Well, very few and people in general do at this well, point. Well, but I mean, that's not what I mean. Parker Fredrickson is a little Fred Hoiberg. I don't mean as good as Fred Hoiberg. I mean the way that he played. And right. you can recruit those players. CJ a little think, bit. I CJ. Think, yeah. What Part of what has happened is there's been a – no, <laughs> we need to get some talent here. So – the other stuff, you know, Fred's got to has to have enough of whatever to say. You know what? I was a really good player, and I played on really good teams for Johnny Orr and Tim Floyd. I'm just going to go ahead and, and and find players who are like me, and let's start there. And maybe maybe you start to get a little better. And I think they've done that. I think this particular team has got guys on it that actually play really hard. That's ironic. That yeah, that's a good point. Why wouldn't he want guys like him? And he said last year multiple times. I mean, he would the the broken record last year was all well, missing shots. It's affecting us on the other end of the court. And in his most frustrated moments last year, Fred would say, "Man, when I was in a shooting slump, yes. that made me want to work even harder at the other end." So that's one hundred percent to your point, and, Sam. Uh, Latman was not a very good player for Nebraska. Played hard, I'm sorry, he wasn't. But but Fred never never knocked him mm-hmm. because he knew how hard he worked. Some of the guys that Fred was frustrated with were were guys that he knew just you know didn't care both ways all right so let's go to the questions we, we're gonna do uh four or five there's some really good ones um and the, we'll save the one of the more controversial ones to last <laughs> but we're gonna start with one that i think has a pretty straightforward answer that you jimmy you probably won't have a thought on sweet um, well, you might uh maybe <laughs> this comes from ryan godin help me see that mark whipple isn't an oc version of bob diaco uh. no one talked about his faults before the season. Then when the Riley era ended, the floodgates of what everyone saw and knew opened up. As a hopeful fan, I'd love to think differently about Whipple. 
Help me out here. Give me a Bob Diaco rundown. When he says Mark Whipple isn't a isn't a Bob Diaco clone, what would that be? Well, I'll I'll speak for thirty seconds, and I'd like you to give that answer. Mark Whipple is very little is not like Bob Diaco at all okay. um, in terms of their personality. And Bob Diaco was the defensive coordinator here in twenty seventeen, and Bob has, to his own admittance, he admitted this to me. Bob has OCD, and it affected. The way that he coached and the way that he talked, he didn't want to talk to the media. He he actually tried to not have that happen. And Riley's like, eh, I want you to talk. Bob would not let you know a microphone be clipped on him. He, um, you know, I watched him line up his multiple phones with his fingertips in his office. Like, there's wow. things going. And, and Bob's brilliant. Like he is brilliant. But there's a lot of things going on there. And the other thing is, at some point. Not long into his time there, he kind of wanted to be the head coach. And so at one point, he took a bunch of the guys out to a park, and they just started doing calisthenics because, um, well, that's what I heard. I didn't see it with my own two eyes. Because he didn't really think Nebraska was working out hard enough in the weight room. So I don't think Mark Whipple wants to run Nebraska's football program, and I think Bob Diaco has a hard time not doing it. The other thing is Bob was coming off a, a distinct failure as the head coach of Connecticut. And Mark Whipple's coming off his biggest success as an offensive coordinator at Pitco. I think all all all, all that is well said, and um, I would just say, in general, offensive coordinators are different from defensive mm. coordinators. Offensive coordinators are really tied to their uh, their quarterback. They're as good as that quarterback. And last year, Mark Whipple became a genius. He did the hot the the hot flavor of the, of the year because of his quarterback. Now. Did he help him? Sure he did. But did the quarterback do some of that too? Yeah. Absolutely he did. Um, so uh, we'll see. Uh, he'll he'll be as good as the quarterbacks he's got in Nebraska. And uh, are there, are, will, will, they, will they be running for their life? And if they are, then I, I then the, it's up to the coordinator to, to, to put in plays where the quarterback doesn't have to get sacked. <laughs> he can run out. He can move around, and, and um, I, I just think it's you – know, I, 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 I don't think he's Diaco either. Um, but I think a big thing for him is everything has to happen fast. Yeah. And what if he likes Chubba better? Is he going to change quarterbacks, in, yeah. you know, before the Oklahoma game? Or what if? And what, what if there's a two-quarterback thing this year? It's the last thing this team needs. So – I'm kind of curious uh, how that's going to end. What, 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 what if Scott says, we want to do this, and Whipple says, no, I think we need to do that. What if? It's an, it's an interesting uh, thing, so we'll see. I've never met anybody like Bob Iaco. I don't think I ever will. He's one of the most interesting people that I have ever met. No question about that. And and I had some conversations with him off the record that were, you know, they were off the record, but... <clears throat> Certainly one of the most interesting and one of the most divisive people. Um, the players really liked him initially, and then they didn't. You, he's you just to different. Be, you, have, you have to be a personality a little bit in this in this program. You can't be you, – you can't shy from the stage at the moment. I feel like Diaco did oh. for, for whatever reasons you things. know. He said, I don't think Whipple is going to shy from any moment. He's going to be – I'm Mark Whipple, by the way – did I tell you that I used to coach Roethlisberger? Oh yeah. Did right. I tell you? They used to, I I I know this guy. And that, that's what we're. It's great. And, and but at some point we're going to have to see you know on the field. But no, I, I don't I don't I don't see comparison. Ryan, just to sum all this up, so I just learned this. I just took drinking a lot of Bob Diaco in the last five minutes. <laughs> Bob Diaco, very hands on, very tightly wound. Sam. Yeah. Okay. Coffee shakes, anxiety, all that stuff. Mark yeah. Whipple, Tom, you would know, San Diego guy, understated, low key. As much as a, as much as an East Coast guy can be, San Diego, yeah. yes. Low key, understated, doesn't need doesn't need that whatever that is that I'm trying to grab the table right now. Just I just get I your hands on everything. I wonder how I much he's of, that way. of him leaving uh, Pitt was maybe was maybe rubbing butting heads with the head coach or going. Maybe this needs to, or just knowing Kenny Pickett's out the door. That's a relationship. Well, that's too. <laughs> and Jordan Allison exactly. might not be far behind them. So, him. him and Frost together again, it has to happen fast. And uh, I, but 
if, if, if and I, I think he'll, he'll, I think he'll put the quarterback in the the the, the, the right place and have him doing the right thing. So I'm optimistic on that front. Yeah. Bob Diaco, Connecticut Navy press conference. You look that up, and you'll <laughs> you'll see what I'm talking about. Mm. He he had a meltdown in real time. Like he lost his well, Nebraska Northwestern lost his deal. bearing. Oh yeah, that one was special too. But the one when he was the head coach and he couldn't. Yeah, what stats? This is from College Football Finest. What stats would Casey Thompson need to put up for Nebraska to win the West? What stats does O'Shawn Mathis need to put up for Nebraska to win the West? I'll answer the second question first. That that doesn't matter that much. You know, if he can be Randy Gregory, and the, Randy Gregory didn't win the West when he was at Nebraska. Sacks so. would be sweet, though. They're fine, but you're, you're not going to win the West or lose the West based on if O'Shawn Mathis has 12 sacks, that doesn't mean you're right. going to win the West. Randy Gregory had that, and they didn't win the West. Um, but the, the first one's got some relevance. What stats would Casey Thompson need to put up for Nebraska to win the West? I know Sam's answer. What is it? Sam likes touchdown passes in the red zone. Uh, touchdown passes certainly help. Um, w- what's interesting is if you look at the the last, certainly last year's quarterback that won the West, Spencer Petrus, was not good. He had very <laughs> little to do with their success. I don't think we can use 20, 2021 Iowa Agreed. as a barometer well, for anything going Agreed. forward. Incident, that is just incidentally, a the, uh, team the, of chaos. The, the, the quarterbacks who've led the teams that won the West since the West was formed are Joel Stave, C.J. Yeah. Bethard, Alex Hornerbrook, Alex Hornerbrook, Clayton Thorson, he was two. the best of the bunch. Alex Hornerbrook, two-time. Jack Cohn, he had a very good season mm-hmm. in 2019. Peyton Ramsey and Spencer Petrus. I, I didn't I didn't rattle off. I, the only guy, the only two that were drafted were Bethard and Thorson, and they weren't drafted in the top three rounds. Um, so I would say it would be good to throw 20 touchdown passes. The yardages are whatever they are, but I'd say 20 to, 20 to 7 would be a good ratio. Um, I'll be surprised. Um, if if that's the ratio, I think he can get to twenty. I think he'll throw more interceptions than seven. I I hate stats and all that stuff. So um, to me, the stat that matters is wins. Um, well, yeah, and man, in this league, don't turn it over. Yeah. And great, point. I, I was I was going to say sixty percent completion, but I believe Adrian had was around there. And, and last year he was seventy. I, I know he's at K State. So um, I, I think win and. Make plays that are, are you know are going to win games, and and don't make plays that are going to lose games. Um, as for the defense, I think the new the, the new defensive linemen are are really big, but they need to tie up the offensive line and let the linebackers stop the run. Mm. This is not the AFC West. The Big Ten is going to run at you right. with their big linemen. You you you. you you have to neutralize at the very least. You can't be dominated. You can't worry about sacks because it's not not that kind of league. Um, yeah, how many – we're talking about sacks with Mathis. How many edges set is he going to have this year? Well, That's almost as important. There are certain games you can look at and go, oh, okay, w- w- when the, when they go to Purdue, they're going to throw it. You want to sack that guy? Go right ahead. Um, they're going to throw it uh, quick, though. Here, here, here comes Goldie Gopher with the, with the they, they, they got a QB who's been around. He's going to throw it, sack him. But I always Wisconsin don't care about that. I going to do that. So I want to tell you something. The last two games are, are going to define so much this year. They are. And they, they may define whether the head coach comes back or not. I'll give you two stats that's one stat. <clears throat> For Casey Thompson, it's third down conversion rate, staying on the field. Big Ten West. Is a game yeah. of sand timers. I like that. I get the ball, sand timer. You get the ball, turn the sand timer over. Where the sand is, wherever the most sand is at the end of the game, that team probably won, right? Mm. So third and six, you need to hit you need to hit a curl route in a tight window, they're playing zone. Can you get it in there? Yes or no? That could different determine a few games. Sure. Flip side of the ball. O'Shawn Mathis is a great weapon. He looks great on tape. He's super fast. He's got a different kind of twitch than a lot of the guys that Nebraska has had in recent years. None of that matters if Nebraska's opponents are consistently converting first downs before third down or they're in third and short where they're going to run the ball because sure. the Big Ten West wants to run the ball anyways. Mm-hmm. So how often can you get opponents into third and five plus, third and six plus? That's the stuff that matters to me. 
Uh, Tom hates stats. I'm zooming super far in the stats that's right okay. now. This is cool. this is game log stuff that yeah, we're talking cool, about man. right sure. here. Yeah. That's the stuff that matters to me. That's the game within the game that Nebraska has lost very often under Scott Frost that matters a ton this mm-hmm. year. So I don't know if you want to talk yards per carry on runs. This is sort of related to that because on first and second down, most Big Ten West teams want to run right at you. So right. can you get can you hold those teams at bay enough to make them throw the ball on third down to let O'Shawn Mathis just focus on one thing, which is attacking the quarterback. Right. Sacks are, you know, sacks are great to get. Sometimes you get them lucky. Sometimes you have a year where you don't get as many. The factor that's important with a good pass rusher is that they take up at least one and usually two people, and it helps everything else. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is if you can have a four-man pass rush and you can drop seven into coverage, you become a much better pass defense. And Nebraska has struggled at times to rush just four and get home. They've had to rush five. Usually Luke Reimer comes up the middle. Or they've had to bring Nick Henrich off the, the edge. Or they've had to bring somebody else. Um, when you don't have an elite pass rush, you have to do that more often. And ideally, what you would love to do, um, just like in basketball, if you have a lockdown defender who doesn't need any help, same thing with pass rusher. If you have a pass rusher who doesn't need any help and can take two, and sometimes he gets there and sometimes he doesn't, it makes it easier for everybody else. Next question. What separates, in your opinion, this is Dylan J. Carroll, in your opinion, what has separated Scott Frost's teams, which have all been under 500, and Pelini's teams, which always won nine games? I'll go real quick because you guys know way more about this than I do. One factor is the floor of the Big Ten is just way higher now than it was when Bo Pelini was here. Good answer. Sam, we talked about this last week, I think, on the podcast. Urban Meyer came into the Big Ten, just completely flipped the conference's recruiting philosophy potential on its head. There are more, like you said before earlier in this podcast, about Iowa. Iowa has been better for, than Nebraska for almost Since a decade now. Almost a decade now. Yeah. They were. It used to be because they were just winning on the margins. Now they're winning on the margins and they got better players. Yeah, that's right. So that's, that's right. my quick answer. Good answer. What do you think? Well, Bo had better players. Um, he had he had difference makers. Abdullah, um, uh, Randy Kenny Gregory. Bell. I mean, uh, Kenny Bell made plays. A lot of these receivers don't. Yeah. Uh, Tommy Armstrong was, you know, and and, they, and even, even even Taylor Martinez, they they, they made plays. Um, they went to bowl games. They, we, we, we've got proof. Um, you know, Demar the. The morning upper, I mean, the personnel. P- personnel. Was, yeah, thank you. I was going to call him. Yeah, it, anyway, <laughs> I'm losing my mind. He's on vacation. Give him a break. He he returned punts for touchdowns. He, he, he was electrifying. Who's that guy? They yeah. don't have that guy. They don't have a lot of these guys. Trey Palmer, fingers crossed. So it, it's amazing that they, you know, Bo for all, didn't like recruiting. He, he got them. He, he got players. So, yeah, he, yeah, he did. He benefited to some degree from the players that were left over from Callahan. I, would argue, I won't argue Sean Watson, but I'll argue Tim Beck's offense worked better than Frost. And it was not dissimilar. It was somewhat yeah. similar. Right. Which is funny because Tim Beck has been and, become like mocked in the college football world as being too yeah. sort of cookie-cutter basic. You saw that the holiday bowl against USC. Holy crap. Yeah, and Frost is you know, was this cutting edge young mind. You know, whatever works, works, man. It doesn't matter the, the, how you do had, it. They had better offensive line coaches. Agreed um, there. I think Barney Cotton and John Garrison um, did a good job. You know, defensively, I, I, I'll take Shenander over Bo. Well, JP, I mean, okay. Bo was the guy, right? But, but um, I, I think Shenander's defense is probably yeah, like is, is more solid. Yeah. I mean, if 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 you if you if you if you knocked out one, uh, t- you know, Bo's defense was was like on toothpicks. The, the scheme. If you took out one toothpick, it's collapsed. Like here comes where here comes Melvin Gordon around the end. <laughs> Just right. sweet. That's right. We can't stop it, even yep. though we know it's coming. So, um, you know, they. It was by 2014. The the nine win thing was really shaky, uh, but he had it. So he did. Um, I don't know why Frost can't win. I don't understand it. I know they don't they don't do th- everything well, but by God, both teams made mistakes too. Um, this program needs 
something good to happen. They need to get lucky. They you sound need like to, Scott now. Huh? You sound like Scott well, now. Well, but it's true. They they need to, and because it's mental. So part of it is, mm-hmm. well, we're going to lose again. Absolutely. You know, Iowa comes in. We're going to wait. Yeah, we know we're going to beat you. Yeah. yeah that, that Nebraska didn't ha- used to have that. So, um, I know I did sound like Scott, didn't I? <laughs> So I'd, I'd, I'd probably get better press conferences. Yeah, I would say that uh, Bo had better players. Amir Abdullah is not a small thing. He was a great player. He's one of the greatest players in Nebraska football history. So you cannot discount him. Um, I think Bo did a better job with special teams. He had better specialists. He had Brett Maher, who's in the NFL. He had Drew Brown, who was very good. Um, he had, I think, he had better specialists when he was was he was in the Big Ten. Sam Foltz was his guy. Sam Foltz was was one of his guys. That's right. Um, what would be the last thing I would say? There was something about Bo that, um, you know, and he had his faults and he's ne- you know, Scott Frost has never bullied reporters. He's never gone on this with, with the exception of one time when he got into it with Khalil Davis, you know, Bo routinely got into it with his players and it was embarrassing. Like, you know, it was, it was, it was embarrassing to watch him do that. And it was a good copy. F bomb them and, you know, have them do it back to him. And it's just weird. But, but here's the thing there were times in Bo Pelini's tenure where you're like, they're not going to win this game. And they found it. They found, they dug somewhere in deep and they, they overcame deficits. And one thing I will say about Frost's teams are when they get behind, they haven't really been able to get back. When they get behind 10 points, boy, that's hard for them to overcome. It just... The a lot ment- of that comes from the head coach. And, I think so. Uh, um, and, and so, Bo, when they get behind 10 nothing, it was the game was not over. They were behind 27-6 against Ohio State, and they came back against a team that beat Wisconsin, the Big Ten champion that year. So, Ohio State was no joke. Um, they had a game where they were behind... Uh, two two touchdowns against Northwestern in 2012, a 10 win Northwestern team. They found a way. Um, they just Bo was able to do that. He he could he could inspire a team. Now the other thing that would happen sometimes with Bo is when it went the wrong way, they get a lead and then it would go bad and then it would fall apart. But Bo had a way of getting into his players and getting them to rally. He just had that gift, and I think Scott hasn't shown necessarily that much now again he's not sitting there faking fights outside the locker uh, outside the meeting Bo did this right he pretended to get in a fight with one of his players outside a meeting room to get a laugh that's a strange thing to do different cat he pretended with his video director to like put was it drugs in his car i can't remember what it was with mike nobler i don't remember that. dirk wrote about that and like yeah. you know like there was a some st- like Bo is a different person and Scott wouldn't do those things, and I think that's probably to Frost's credit. But but Pelini created a weird kind of almost, uh, you know, La Cosa Bostra, I used to call it. Bo's thing. He just created something within there where they could go win games at times. And I think we were all worn out after seven years, but he, there was a special knack. And I think Frost, very few people have it, and, and I don't know that Frost has shown it. All right, here's the last question, and you can decline to answer if you oh. want. Um. And we are not saying that Nebraska football will not have a good season. Okay, we're not saying that. We're saying that we don't know. I think we're that's what we've that been we saying. We don't know. If the season goes south, who would be potential head coach candidates? I don't want that to happen. This this commenter says. <laughs> but if it does, <laughs> I'll give I'll give one. You guys again, way way deeper on this than I am. Uh, I think there's just, Mickey Joseph is certainly a candidate for that job, both because. I think he speaks like a head coach. If we're talking CEO types, he's the guy when we were talking about culture changes earlier. I think he's someone who's capable of doing that. He's, I think he's done it to some degree in the receiver room. And I think that he carries enough cachet and he, there's no, like some guys are fake, fake iron fist guys. I don't sure. think he's a fake iron fist guy. And I think people respond well to that sort of coaching. So I think he could do it on a, on a broader level and just logistically, if you want to, you know, let's, you know, if you fire the head coach and you want to save as many recruiting connections, commitments, whatever, as you can, Mickey Joseph's a great guy to do that. Yeah, I mean, I, I, it depends on what kind of season they have. If he's not here, what kind of season was it? And 
how, how, much, how much blame do you, do, you, do you put on Mickey Joseph for that? Um, so I don't know who would be. I really don't want to get into that un- until it happens. Yep. Uh, I, I wouldn't write that, so I'm not going to say it here. But I, but I think it's obvious. It's going to be somebody that, you know, is going to fit Trev Alberts' idea or the, the, the vision for the program. And that is, you, you got to be disciplined. You got you you got to execute. You got to have the culture. You got to you know be smart. You got to be very physical. All the things Nebraska yeah. used to do it better. Feel, than it feels in the to country. me like Trev Alberts' vision of what Nebraska football should be lines up with the Big Ten West. Right, and that's that's smart because you have to mm-hmm. beat them first. Right. I mean, so, but maybe you can do what they do and then out recruit them or out nil them yeah. or whatever or you know whatever it is. Um, however, you get players these days, but I think it's 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 pretty clear what he wants it to be, and that to me is is what Scott Frost needs to show this year and, and or next year is that he is the guy to deliver what Trev wants. Mm. Sam, give us some crazy names. Okay, well I won't you know I won't go overboard either to be clear there's another question on here i want to say this i I actually think if nebraska wins six games we are in year one of a two-year conversation i know i said that last year but i I really believe that i i don't think there's any any desire to 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 move on um i think there is a real sense of scott needs a long runway he didn't get a lot of help prior to trev getting there and like by help i mean mentorship conversation anything bill moose infrastructure infrastructure lots of things and so i think People are like, well, they better win eight. I know some people have said that. I'm like, if they win six, I think Scott Frost is going to return. Well, what, well, what, what kind of help did he need? I mean, when he was hired here, we we did a book on the guy. I mean, he was already a genius, right? And I was part of that. Yeah. So how, what kind of help did he need? I mean, he was the hottest head coach in the country. So five years, I mean, four years, no bull. I mean, I don't know if he, if he, if he, can, if he can blame Bill Moose for that. I don't blame Bill Moose for it. Um, what I what I would say is that uh, I think it there there was probably a a period of time there where here's how you win in the Big Ten here's here's well, that, that, that's up to him to know that understood and he didn't I I actually excuse him from that because he didn't grow up in the Big Ten he's new right. to it but you better figure it out quick. And I think the other thing I think is that there's just there was a lot of there was a lot of er, here I'll give you an example okay. The best example I can give you. The Maurice Washington situation, honestly, even if he didn't like it, should have been taken out of his hands. Okay. It should have been, it should have been, uh, no, we're going to take care of this one. But that didn't affect player, that, player, well, I, I actually it's, think it, it's it emblematic, affected, though. It affected that team that dragged out for a really long time. Right. It's a huge distraction. But it didn't impact last year. No, it didn't. But is that why they know, lost to Iowa? Last and year? then the other piece is twenty-one to nine. Or up. The the perspective on COVID of like, do we do we really need to have the players back in April? Do we really need to have them here all summer? Is that you know you're going to get them yeah. exhausted? So there's, I could talk about that for a while, yeah. but I'll just, the COVID I'll just thing say was such a weird the Maurice time. Washington situation right. was not handled very well. Right. Um, the names. So to be clear, I think Scott actually names. is going to be back in twenty twenty-three because well, I think he's going to. So here, the, the the names that I thought of last year um, are currently the head coaches at Washington and Oregon, mm. and both of them I believe would have come here. Mm. Uh, Dan Lanning is from North Kansas City; he's the Oregon head coach, and then the uh, coach at Washington is the former Fresno State head coach, and uh, he uh, cut his teeth in Sioux Falls. And so I think both those guys probably would have eventually come here. Um, so I, so internally, I think your candidate's good. I would throw Eric Chenander in there. Um, and then I would, uh, you know, Matt Campbell. Yeah. That's the name I was thinking too. I mean, how can you, you know, I mean, and uh, if you're him, there's so much nothing incentive wrong, to nothing yeah. wrong with any, with any that, by the way, any that. big 12 or ACC coach you like right now, I think that you, sure. have, you have a pathway to get him. And so there's Lance Leipold. I, you know, I don't know, you know, Lance is former UNO coach. Um, so th- there's names out there, but I'll be honest with you. I think the best thing for Nebraska is to have a good season and to, and to, and to continue the Scott Frost experiment for a couple of years with this staff, this particular staff, this staff. Um, I think he should have switched out his staff a couple of years ago. He didn't. He now it's been done, and now we're going to see. I suspect we got a seven and five season coming, but we'll see. 
That is the end of our Pick 6 podcast for this week. It's fun. We'll be back next week to preview Big Ten Media Days. By then, we'll know the players. I already know the players. But by then, the players will have been announced. What a, what a flex. We'll talk about that. We'll talk about uh, we'll talk about Big Ten Media Days, and we'll talk about Tom's Sunday column, which will be next Sunday, July twenty fourth. Yep. All right. We'll be back for Tom and Jimmy. I'm Sam. Thanks for listening to the Pick Six Podcast. <clears throat>